What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the HQ. Welcome back to the channel. It's Big Dogs Gotta Eat BDGE. I think that's cut off. Fantasy football, y'all get the point. I'm Nicholas. Thank you for joining me today. We are going to talk about some players to avoid, some players that you should not draft, specifically the running back position. So running backs to avoid in 2019 fantasy football. These are guys that I'm not drafting anywhere near their ADP, where they're currently going right now. And as I always do when I'm making these videos surfacing around 2019 fantasy football, YouTube, you heard that, put that shit into your algorithm, 2019 fantasy football, I use draft.com ADP. For those of you that are very new to fantasy football, what I mean by ADP is just their average draft position where on average they're getting picked. And on draft.com, these are all paid leagues. So you're getting an actual idea of where players are going because people don't want to put money into leagues and then pick kickers in the seventh round. This is the most accurate ADP data you're going to find. It's like fantasy football calculator. Those numbers are horrible. Point being, we got a good video for y'all today. Memorial Day weekend probably just wrapped up. You guys are watching this on Tuesday. It's Saturday right now. So I'm going to film this, edit it, upload it, cue it up, and then go drink about 32 margaritas. But let's get into it. 2019 fantasy football running backs to avoid. All right, let's kick it off with the first running back. My mom's calling me. I think she gets nervous on weekends like this, like Memorial Day weekend, Labor Day. She knows a lot of bad things are coming, so she says her last goodbye. But but on a serious note, before I jump into my running backs to avoid, uh, I want to hear down below in the comment section who you guys are avoiding. There are probably some first round running backs that you guys want no part of. That whole like third to fifth round has been a landmine for the most part for the last couple of years in terms of trying to pick high upside guys that rarely work out and the wide receivers have been very safe. So I found myself avoiding a lot of the guys in that area. Uh, we're gonna break down probably like three or four guys in depth and then kind of throw out a couple honorable mentions at the end of the video. But comment down below, who are some running backs that you guys are avoiding at all costs? And don't throw out names that have ADPs of like 90 or above. Like obviously no one's targeting those guys. Some guys in the you know first, second, third, fourth, fifth round range that you want no part of. Comment that down below, hit the thumbs up button while you're down there. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. Let's get into it. My number one guy that I'm avoiding, not my number one guy, but the highest ADP on this list. And this one hurts to say, but it's Devonta Freeman of the Atlanta Falcons. And I, I've been getting, I can't go, I can't put one video out without people telling me that this is a the wrong pick and that he is a s absolute fucking steal in the third and fourth round. And if you're going to comment and tell me not to curse, please don't waste your time. Devonta Freeman, I'm a Falcons fan and I appreciate Devonta Freeman. I appreciate his running style. I appreciate everything he's done for the Dirty Birds and those amazing years that he has given us as Falcons fans and as fantasy players. But guys, you, you got to be objective here. He is 5'8", 205 pounds. He doesn't run like he's 5'8", 205 pounds. He runs like Marshawn Lynch. It's hard to stay healthy when you run like that and you're that size in the NFL. And uh, that has caught up to him. Over the last two seasons, Devonta Freeman has missed a ton of games with a plethora of injuries. I had Dr. Jesse Morse, right? I I'm a doctor, so you can listen to me. But if you want a doctor, doctor... I think that's what the kids are saying, right? They put two words together. The same word makes it more emphatic. If you want a doctor doctor, Dr. Jesse Morse came on my channel about a month ago and talked about running backs to avoid or target based on their previous injury history. And Devonta Freeman is basically on his do not draft list. This is the part that, that absolutely drives me nuts. He's currently RB13 off the board, 25th pick overall. And this is on draft.com where all of the drafts are paid for. 25th overall, RB13. So when I started writing this blog like a month or a month or so ago, a month or so ago. I think I did a video like this two months ago. Devonta Freeman was higher than this. He was like pick 33, 35, RB17, and he keeps moving up and up and up. And maybe that had to do with not taking a running back until the fifth round in the draft, but we're going to break it down a little bit. And here are the injuries that Freeman has dealt with since 2015. It's hamstrings. It's multiple concussions. You can see a concussion in November 2015, concussion in August 2017, then another concussion in November 17, and these are obviously only the reported ones. Uh, he's had MCL, PCL, knee issues, foot issues, groin issues. Guys, like this is not a guy who just because they say, oh, he's going to be healthy for OTAs, doesn't have a lot of these lingering issues. He's like one concussion away from being out of the NFL. That's one. Two, some of these, like the PCL and the MCL, I forget uh, uh, what the actual diagnosis was, but one of those things has like a two-year linger period. Whereas in ACL, you have that nine to 12 month recovery and it's a tough recovery, but you're usually good to go by that second year. Some of these linger with you and that will cause other injuries because they have a weakness in the knee. Thus, some other body part in your lower extremity needs to work harder. And that is what we've been seeing from Devonta Freeman. His injury history, history is thorough and there's a very high chance of him re-injuring something this year or getting hurt, especially because 
the way he runs. If he didn't run that way, I would say, you know what? I like what we're seeing from Devonta Freeman. If he was borderline fourth, fifth round pick, but at pick 25, I just think it's it, it's ridiculous. And we're breaking down the numbers. I have my notes here, so I apologize if I'm looking over here and then looking over here. This is my good side anyways. So I'm looking at running backs under Dan Quinn and just Devonta Freeman's receiving workload, right? This is why the argument for Freeman is, is getting more drastic this year because everyone's like, oh, they didn't really draft the running back and he's a great pass catcher and blah, 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 blah. But ever since the, the, that those breakout years that Freeman had, his receiving workload and his total workload workload have dipped each season. It's going down, it's going down, it's going down. I'm talking about on a per game basis. Obviously, he's missed games. I'm not looking at it in totality because if you play 12 games, you're obviously going to have lower numbers. But on a per game basis, his numbers in terms of receptions, targets, carries per game have all continuously gone down. No running back under Dan Quinn has eclipsed a 17% target share since 2016. And backs under New Falcons offensive coordinator Dirk Cutter haven't eclipsed a 16% target share since 2015. Devonta Freeman's 10% target share back in 2017, which was his last full season, is what we should anticipate in 2019 with Ido Smith near a 6% mark, which he soaked up in 2018, which I think is going to rise because we've heard reports that they want to use him more. Both could be limited in PPR leagues with Atlanta focusing on getting the ball to its strong wide receiver core. That was actually a quote per Mike Clay in a a really good article that he did earlier this offseason. And I'll link it for you guys down below. It's Mike Clay, what I learned doing my projections this year or whatever. A lot of interesting stats in that article. So I'd suggest you you, uh, check that out below. But it's basically getting to the point where Dan Quinn doesn't necessarily use his running backs that much in the passing game, and neither does Dirk Cutter. At least they haven't for a long time. And I don't think Freeman is enough of a, you know, if it was like Christian McCaffrey, obviously, the chicken or the egg argument, but I don't think Freeman is enough to push that 18% target mark. We've also seen Freeman with Dirk Cutter, right? There was a report that came out like very recently. Uh, Freeman, there was a video that surfaced. Freeman's like, I'm excited to get back with Dirk Cutter. You know, I, it was killing me being off the field last year. And I guess that, that, you know, that gets people excited for literally no reason other than just seeing that player. We literally have a sample size of Devonta Freeman with Dirk Cutter. Dirk Cutter was the OC for Atlanta back in 2014 during Devonta Freeman's rookie year. And obviously you have to take that with a grain of salt because it's his rookie year. But the next year when Cutter was gone and what it was, what did he grow? Six months? It was, it was a six month difference. Freeman was a beast and that's when he broke out. But during that rookie year, it was bad. He had his lowest touch, his lowest yards per carry total, his lowest yards per reception total. So the volume was down, but so was his efficiency. He was used in a three-way split between 31-year-old Steven Jackson and Jacquez Rogers. And none of them averaged more than 3.8 yards per carry or 7.5 yards per reception. So nothing was efficient out of that backfield. Again, one of the one of the problems I see with Devonta Freeman is I I, I really, really, really believe we're going to look back at 28, 2019 and Freeman's was going to be used as <coughs> pretty much a two down workload guy, like a two down in between the tackles grinder with maybe like 30 catches on the year. And I don't see him putting up the 1300 rushing yards to the point where 30 catches is not a big deal, right? He needs more production. Edo Smith, while he wasn't great last year, he, he really didn't even look good when you watch him. He is a very good pass catcher. He was a prolific pass catcher back in college. You look at the numbers, he had an 89th percent, uh, 89th percentile college target share, most comparable to Shane Vereen, also put up monster production from a rushing standpoint, right? And, and coach Dan Quinn said he comes out and he expects Edo Smith to see a significant increase in offensive looks this season. What I'll say is, yeah, like if Freeman is still the superior runner and if he's healthy, that will be his role. He will still get the first, second down role. We'll see how much they use him on the goal line. But again, they pass a lot more on the goal line than they run the ball. And we're looking at Dirk Cutter as the offensive coordinator. And that's what I expect when you have Julio, when you have now Calvin Ridley, Austin Hooper is developing as you know a weapon over the middle. I don't like Austin Hooper as a fantasy option, but I don't necessarily see Devonta Freeman getting you know 20 goal line looks like he had during his breakout year. Now I get the argument, right? I, I'm, I try not to be one-sided. I try not to be biased. And uh, this is me telling you that I don't want a Falcon. So I feel like that's already unbiased. Admittedly, Devonta Freeman absolutely absolutely came away from the NFL draft as a, as a winner in theory, because they used two first round picks. They used their 14th overall pick on Chris Lindstrom, offensive lineman from Boston College, traded back into the first round, grabbed Caleb McGarry, another offensive lineman. So they used two offensive picks, two first round picks on offensive linemen, which is obviously a big boost, right? Because Lindstrom will be an upgrade to the interior of the Atlanta's offensive line, which was a very disappointing part of their offense, which has been elite, almost elite in years prior. Then they took a step back last year and they're obviously seeing how important it is for that to be a core piece of their offense. Now I have a bunch of numbers here. When I'm looking at these offensive linemen, both of them are far superior pass blockers than actual run blockers. I mean, they're both good in the run blocking game. Obviously, if you're a first round lineman, you're probably well-rounded, but their strong points are as pass blockers. Lindstrom allowed just four pressures in all of 2018 to the quarterback. He was PFF's third overall graded offensive guard in the draft, second in pass blocking, but 21st in run blocking. Caleb McGarry was the other first rounder, 
good all-around lineman, like I said, great athlete, but ranked 54th in run blocking success per PFF last year. And the passing game allowed just one quarterback hit last year. So again, it looks like with their cutter coming in, you saw in the offenses, like they throw the ball 65 plus percent of the time. Adding these pass blocking linemen doesn't necessarily tell me that they want to use Devonta Freeman more. They didn't use a pick until the fifth round on this kid, Quadri Allison, out of the University of Pittsburgh. I like Allison a lot, man. I really like Allison. Of these guys that went in like the fifth to seventh round, he's one of my favorite guys. I'm glad he went in the fifth and not like all the way down in the seventh. He's massive. 6'1", 228 pounds. He can also catch the ball, right? He's got size. Surprisingly shifty for someone that is 6'1", 228 pounds. And I'm not saying he's definitely not a receiving back, but he caught 50 passes during his time at Pittsburgh, including a 23 catch junior season, average 8.4 yards per reception. Both Allison and Freeman ran a 4 5 8, 40 yard dash at the combine. Allison is obviously 228 pounds, which puts him in the 74th percentile weight adjusted speed score. Freeman, 206 pounds, 208 pounds. So y'all can do the math. And listen, I'm not arguing that Allison's going to take over the role here or anything, but I just see absolutely no scenario where Freeman is getting 22 touches a game. That's what he got in 2015. Then in 2016, he saw 17 and a half touches per game. In 2017, 16 and a half touches per game. So we're seeing the touch totals go further down, further down, further down. I know Tevin Coleman is gone, obviously, right? But I really think most of those are going to be eaten up by Ito Smith in the passing game, as well as Quadri Allison uh, as a change of pace guy early down, maybe goal line, maybe some short yardage work, given the fact that his size is so big. So for Freeman, he's been on a downward trajectory in terms of volume and efficiency. But again, what scares me the most is the injury concern. I really think as I become a better season long player in the early parts of your draft, first, second, third rounds are where you should be risk averse. Uh, risk averse can be a tricky word because any I think you could probably make an argument for any player kind of being risky, but injuries are where I start being more risk averse now. And I think anyone that you draft in the first three rounds of a draft and you have to preface your argument with if he stays healthy this year, I think that's someone that you need to move down in your draft board. I keep hearing of this imaginary RB1 ceiling that Freeman is going to have if he stays healthy. It's just not there, guys. He, the last full season he had, he averaged 16 and a half touches a game and he comes with that injury risk. So from my angle, there's no way I'm using anywhere near a third round pick on him. I probably wouldn't even consider him unless he dropped to the late fourth, probably the fifth round at the earliest. He is somehow going ahead of Marlon Mack, Aaron Jones, Karrion Johnson. Uh, like, nah. That is my write-up on Devonta Freeman. Sorry that was so elongated, but I feel like I had to explain myself because every video that I talk shit about Devonta Freeman, I get a lot of backlash. So whether you agree or disagree, I try to get all the big facts out there for you. If you did find some value or if you found some information that you'd never heard of, make sure you go drop that thumbs up down below. Let's move on to number two. My number two back, and I feel like this is such an easy fade, but it's Mark Ingram of the Baltimore Ravens. And the reason it's an easy fade is not because I necessarily think he's gonna have a shitty year, although I don't think he's gonna be good whatsoever, but he's going as RB21, 39th pick overall. So that's right after the third round ends. That's where he's going off the board. This is actually disgusting. Like, I don't know who would take Mark Ingram as a top 40 pick this year in fantasy football. It makes no sense. Like, did people not learn their lesson from the Ravens offense and, and Alex Collins last year? And Collins was a guy I liked, but that was 100% talent-based. And that's where it kind of skewed me wrong and not thinking of rational coaching decision, right? The Ravens just historically use a running back by committee, man. They don't commit to one featured back. They use different guys on the goal line last year. We saw Alex Collins. We saw Gus Edwards. We saw Buck Allen. For you trying to plan for what this running back core is going to be, is it's almost as difficult as planning for what the Patriots are going to do. In between the 20s, they use guys in the receiving role all scattered around in different roles at all times. They ride the hot hand all the time. If it wasn't Alex Collins last year, it was guess Gus Edwards, right? And now they just drafted this guy who I love, Justice Hill. Justice Hill is a fourth rounder out of Oklahoma State. He adds something to this backfield that they haven't had here for a long time. Justice Hill is an absolute playmaker, an explosive playmaker. He handled a huge workload at Oklahoma State. I don't think he'll ever take over as, as the workhorse here. And I say that, that I don't think he'll ever take over as a workhorse because he's 5'10", 198 pounds. Best comparable player, Reggie Bush on player profiler. So he's small in size, but he absolutely blew away the combine. The fastest combine 40 of any running back, 4'4", so almost cracked that fourth, the, the high 4'3s. 81st percentile weight adjusted speed score, 95th percentile burst score. He's had seasons at Oklahoma State where he carried 206 uh he had 206 carries, he had 268 carries, and he was splitting the backfield with Chris Carson. So the fact that he demanded work there, he also had a 31 catch season while he was there and 16 touchdowns from scrimmage. So the fact that he was able to command a lot of work while Chris Carson was also there tells you that he's a pretty damn good player. I love Justice Hill. I think he's gonna eat into that workload sooner rather than later. I think he's someone that you're gonna see, hear a lot of buzz from as training camp starts moving through. I think Ingram is a very solid NFL running back. Like we're going to look back on his career and we're going to be like, you know, he was really solid, very underrated just in terms of the versatility he brings to the game. But he, trem he tremendously benefited from being behind the New Orleans Saints elite 
like run blocking offensive line. Do I think Ingram can be a good runner in Baltimore this year? I, I mean, I do, yes, especially with Lamar Jackson at quarterback. That opens up a lot of holes. We know the, the whole mobile quarterback, running quarterback theory in terms of the linebacker has to, you know, stick onto the quarterback and that thus is basically like 11 on 10, more holes for the running back, whatever. I wouldn't even be surprised if Ingram ends up averaging 4.5, 4.7 yards per carry. The problem is like, are those going to be in between the 20s carries? Is he going to get 200 carries and catch 28 balls, 34 balls with like six touchdowns? That's not something I want to use my end of the third, early fourth round pick on. I'm going to give you guys a scenario. Over under total touchdowns for Mark Ingram this year, six and a half. Drop a comment down below. Do you think Ingram will score more or less than six and a half touchdowns this year? Because I have trouble pushing the button on on over six touchdowns, to be honest with you. I think Lamar Jackson should be a little bit more efficient. I think Ingram is going to be as efficient-ish, maybe a little less than he was in New Orleans. But Lamar Jackson is still going to run the ball 10, 12 times a game. That kills a lot of clock for this offense. I don't think this offense is particularly going to be a very high scoring one, at least not in 2019. I think they put a lot of good pieces in place for it to, you know, move forward from the future and eventually be a high scoring offense. But I think all the rushing that they're going to do is just going to take a lot of clock off. If you want Mark Ingram and you want 14 carries a game at 4.8 yards per carry, be my guest. Ingram is your guy, but not inside the top 40 picks, not as the top 20 running back. And uh, just a side note, the other thing like about top 20 running backs, people get excited. Like, you know, people always use the analysis like, oh, he finished as RB21. So he was an RB2. The problem with that analysis is like you're averaging out the entire league. So if you play in a 12 team league and you say, oh, RB2030 is an RB2, you're basically splitting it up. So each person has an RB1, each person has an RB2, nice and even, but that's not the way leagues work. And that's not the way you win leagues, right? If, if you're happy with having your RB1 be maybe the RB8 overall, and then your RB2 be the RB21 overall, that's not going to win you your league, right? You don't want, I mean, you do, obviously, if you're in a deeper league or if like the RB24 is maybe like your flex or your second flex, great. That's nice padding. But for the most part, like where you're, where you're taking Ingram at pick 40 overall, and again, guys, these are, these are paid leagues. So I'm not just like making up a fucking ADP over here. People are taking him at pick 40. You now have to rely on him to be a high upside RB2 in order for you to compete for playoff spots and stuff. When you hear the analysis like, oh, this guy was an RB2, it's like, if you're a low end RB2, for the most part, you're there because your production probably wasn't really that good. And you were probably inconsistent. Like a Terry Cohen might finish the year as the RB19 overall, but how many games could you confidently start him? How many games did he really give you those good numbers? Sometimes, but you probably benched him for maybe 20% of the games that he should have been in your lineup. So it becomes a problem when you start getting uh, happy about taking the RB22. You want two RB, two top 15 running backs, realistically. I'm all off of Mark Ingram. Let me know what your guys' thoughts are about Mark Ingram. I, I, I really, it's not someone that you could probably sway me that heavily because I think Gus Edwards was very good last year. I think they'll use him to change a pace. I think Justice Hill is going to get a lot of the receiving workload and he's going to eat into the workload of Mark Ingram a lot more than people realize. I'm not looking anywhere near there. Some other guys I definitely are just far off my list for injury wise. Todd Gurley and Leonard Fournette, where they're currently being drafted, are nowhere near my radar. So Todd Gurley has the arthritis in his knee. Again, this is. Uh, a lot of these breakdowns, injury related, were in the video I did with Dr. Jesse Morse, which I will link down below. Is one of probably the most popular video I've done all off season, and I wouldn't be surprised if it is going to be the most popular video I do all summer. Definitely the most valuable for me from a learning standpoint. And I'm going to have Dr. Jesse Morse back on the channel again in the summer. You know, when training camps kick off and we do start seeing more actual live injuries, not talking about last year's injuries. But I would highly, highly recommend checking you out, checking that out, because we talk about Todd Gurley, we talk about Dalvin Cook, Leonard Fournette, Devonta Freeman, and all of the injuries uh, that the running back suffered last year. And this arthritis is obviously a problem. You know, the, we made that video prior to any of the noise that's been happening now. Now we're seeing Gurley go as a late second round pick. But when we made that video, he was like a top three pick. Dr. Jesse Moore said, fade him. The knee is a big issue. Then we saw them re-sign Malcolm Brown. We saw them trade up in the third round, which is heavy draft capital on running back when you have Todd Gurley there to grab Daryl Henderson, the third running back off the board. So Todd Gurley is almost getting to the point where if I have to take him in the top two rounds, he's on my do not draft list because he's going to wear down or he's just simply not going to get the volume in order to be the RB1 that you're picking him as. Leonard Fournette, again, like this is not just a guy who's injury prone. There's science behind this and Doc, uh, Dr. Morris broke it down. The injuries that he's suffered throughout his career and his college career on his ankles are literally deteriorating away at the ligaments and the bones or whatever it is. I don't know the fucking terminology behind it of his ankles. So there are guys like Gavin Cook who had the hamstring injury last year, but doesn't have severe like ankle problems. Um, he's two years removed from the ACL. So that should be completely fine. So those are like, I don't want to say fluky because they happen often, but those are injuries that you can't predict with Leonard Fournette. Like there's a reason why he keeps suffering all these lower body injuries. And it's because his ankles are extremely weak, which 
causes other parts of his body to compensate for those ankles. And that's the reason why people are like, he's such a good pick in the third round because it's upside. But it's like, when you say you have to factor in missed games, like you literally have to do that. If you're not expecting Leonard Fournette to miss a lot of games, then you're not factoring him correctly and you need to push him down your board a little bit. Derrick Henry is just a guy I don't want either. Um, and, and the reason, you know, the reason I don't want these guys is again, I'm looking at their ADPs. Todd Gurley is running back six, the seventh pick overall. Leonard Fournette running back 14, overall number 27. I don't want to use my third round pick on him. Derrick Henry running back 15, overall pick 29. Don't want to use my third round pick on him. I know a lot of guys like Derrick Henry, but again, I think when you look at that third, fourth, fifth round of running backs, they're always landmines. The high majority of them bust. And I have someone actually, someone who's good into analytics. I have them working on a project for me. and I'll keep you guys updated on this. I told him to go round by round. I wanted to see what's the likelihood of a fantasy running back being picked in each round and what their likelihood of finishing as a top 12 running back is. So I'm excited to see the results of that. I'll share those with you guys when I have them. But again, that, that middle round is just, those middle rounds are, are very, very landmine-ish. And when I look back and see what's the reason why one guy failed and one guy didn't, the majority of the time it's because the guys are not pass catchers, especially in today's day, uh, day and age in the NFL. And Derrick Henry is the furthest thing from a pass catcher. So he's a middle round guy who people are getting excited about from a uh, four game sample size and he doesn't catch passes. That's a guy I don't want anywhere near the third round. He is someone where as like a Leonard Fournette or a DeMonte Freeman needs to fall very far because I'm scared about their injury concerns. I'm not scared about an injury concern with Derrick Henry. So if Henry falls, he's a guy that obviously if I'm wrong on, it's going to hurt me because if people that are high on Henry and get that right, and he is like a top five running back or whatever, that's going to hurt all of my team. So he's probably someone who I'm not concerned injury wise. I would just rather take him at the late fourth, you know, fifth round. So if I'm in five or six redraft leagues, Henry's a guy that I probably will take in one, maybe two if he falls, you know, past his value in a couple of those, because uh, I do want to diversify the revenue always. And Philip Lindsay, running back 23, pick 47 overall. I'm starting to see the ADP kind of move back a little bit. New coaching staff. I think they they give this whole running back slate completely new competition between him and Royce Freeman. Obviously, Royce Freeman was a third round pick last year. Pretty good draft capital. Phil Lindsay also has the wrist injury that he had surgery and he's not going to be back until they're still taking it without a timetable pretty much. So they don't know when he's going to be back. And that just gives more time for Freeman to get acquainted with the coaching staff. And I think Freeman is a quality back. I mean, looking at the number, PFF, Pro Football Focus, and Player Profiler on every single metric, efficiency, yards created, evaded tackles, elusiveness, juke rate, yards created for the second time. Just wanted to back that up. Royce Freeman outproduced and was more efficient than Philip Lindsay in every single category except run blocking efficiency, people. That was the difference. And that has nothing to do with Lindsay's ability. That is all the offensive line. So realistically, yes, Lindsay had an absolutely awesome year and uh, I owned him in a lot of leagues. So I'm, I'm happy about that, of course. But I don't think the delta between the two running backs is where it needs to be yet. And Philip Lindsay in the top four rounds is not a pick that I want to make right now. He's just too small to handle that big of a workload year over year. And we saw it, you know, play came towards the end of the year where his efficiency dropped. And then of course he got hurt. So Lindsay at that current ADP is someone I'm completely Right. Running back 26, overall 51. He was the same player for four years prior to breaking out last year. And it was literally because Sony Michelle and Rex Burkhead, their other two running backs, were out for the majority of the season. Rex Burkhead is back. Sony Michelle is back. They drafted Damian Harris in the third round. James White, yes, he'll still be like a PPR back that that is a big part of this offense, but he's nowhere near the back that he was last year. And you saw it over the second half of the year when these other backs started getting more healthy when Sonny Michelle and Rex Burkhead were back to playing their normal roles. James White's role was significantly scaled back from what he was doing over the first half of the year. Again, I talked about this on the live stream too. It's like when you're drafting these pass catching backs, it's like playing fucking whack-a-mole, right? Their ADP rises the year after they blow up and they have their big year and then you, you, you draft them way higher than they normally would be picked. And it's very rare that you see those crazy efficiency numbers or that crazy volume repeat itself year over year. And then the guy that fell off is the guy that ends up, you know, bouncing back. It's like the Chris Thompson's, the James White's, the Geo's, like those guys, the Tariq Cohen's. It's, it, it, it's very hard to predict when they blow up, but for the most part, it's usually them being a later round pick. Then they have their big year and then you have to draft them at almost where their ceiling is. So I have no interest in those guys, especially in season long. In best ball, sure, the, the ADP is fine. But in season long, you also have to decide when to play them. And that's what, you know, consistency is almost nearly as important as the actual production itself when you look back on the year. So a lot of running backs on this list. Again, I want to hear what running backs you guys are avoiding at all costs. So there's a lot of value there, hopefully a lot of information. Uh, if you guys want all of the information that I put out throughout the entire summer, we're going five videos a week starting June 1st, starting next week. I'm going to compile the absolute best, most valuable information I do throughout the entire summer, throw it into the Big Dogs draft guide, which is literally like an online magazine or an online website. We'll give you everything you need for your 2019 fantasy football season, y'all. It's on bigdogsdraftguide.com. 
um, if you pre-order before June 1st, it'll be 20% off the launch price. So go check that out at bigdogsdraftguide.com. It'll have my big board top 250 rankings, all of my positional rankings broken down by tiers, my top sleepers, my top busts, players to target, players to avoid. I'm telling just all of the best stuff through all of my videos that I put out in the summer is going to be condensed easily digestible for y'all. PPR, half PPR, standard. Get it on your phone. Get it on your computer. Get it on your tab ta tablet. Print it out if you need to. I I'm telling you, you, you need to look no further than this draft guide. Um, just look at some of the reviews on the website of the people that bought it last year. I cannot wait to bring it to y'all. We out. I'm going to go enjoy Memorial Day weekend. Y'all do the same for this upcoming weekend, I guess. Stay tuned for Thursday's Fade the Public video, and I will see y'all then.